Hello, and welcome to Season 3, Episode 8 of the ESG Experience, the podcast about all things ESG and beyond. Whether you're an ESG expert or just dipping your toes into the ESG universe, this podcast is for you. Together, we'll navigate the alphabet soup of ESG, share strategies, and discuss industry news and trends. I'm Healy Lev, CRO of ESG at Conservus. And I'm Ryan Nelson, the CEO of ESG at Conservus. Today, we are fortunate and lucky enough, fortunate and lucky, both, to be joined by Chris J, Chris Gray, excuse me, who's the CTO of Renew Communities to discuss the role existing buildings play when it comes to global carbon emissions and why we must focus on making our existing building stock more energy resilient as opposed to only prioritizing new energy efficient building products and projects. Um, and I like this topic because people often do ask, like, sure, you can ground up, um, you know, build a new building that has all of the state of the art technology and all of the, you know, perfect systems. But what about all the existing building stock, right? So I love that you guys are specifically addressing this because it is something we get asked all the time, right? Do you leave those for dead and just keep building new buildings? Or, um, you know, is there something to be had for them? So, all right, Chris, this is the part where I'm going to embarrass you. I'm just going to read off all your accolades. But for the pre-conversation, I won't call you doctor, I'll just call you Chris, but it, it's uh, I have to resist the temptation. All right, so as CTO of Renew, Chris oversees the techno-economic evaluation of Renew's carbon neutral energy efficiency retrofit program, as well as the company's technology and platform development. He brings an extensive background in energy and engineering, is skilled in HVAC, energy efficient efficiency applications and construction. He spent over 15 years working within the energy industry in a variety of roles, including technology, R&D, sales, key accounts, and business development. He has a BS and MS in mechanical engineering and a PhD in civil engineering, along with professional engineering licenses in multiple states. And I think we also determined that um, both the hosts of this podcast, as well as the guests today, are self-proclaimed nerds. So uh, we're good with it. But welcome, Chris. We're happy to have you here today. Thank you so much. Welcome. Happy to be here. So, Chris, I got an idea here. Um, we want to solve this challenge of climate change and uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Let's not worry about the existing buildings. Let's just make sure we build all the new buildings perfectly and make them net zero. Is that going to work? <laughs> Yeah, so let's roll with that for a second. We're going to abandon every single building that's currently in use. Maybe not all of them. We, we might be able to save, you know, a tenth of a percent that are net zero already. We're going to uh, find new resources very quickly to rebuild all of the millions of buildings in the world that we need uh, in the next 30 years. And we want every one of those to be net zero. Sure. Sounds doable, right? Yeah. No challenge. Uh, I, I sense a little uh, sarcasm in there. Uh, I think you want to focus on fixing up some of the existing ones. You know, there's, you often hear the the stat that 50% of the existing building stock will still be in play in 2050, right? Uh, 30 years from now, when we have to hit this goal of net zero energy, and we're only going to have 50% of the buildings in place today still around then and i don't buy that i think the number is much higher you know i think 80 uh -huh. maybe even 90 percent of the buildings will still be around in 27 years when we hit 2050 so um that 50 percent number has been thrown around I, I think i've read it for a, a decade now and it it just under emphasizes how important the existing building stock is. And we have to focus on existing buildings because population's growing, demand for square footage and real estate is growing. So the thought that we're just going to abandon um, all of these buildings is not realistic. We're going to have to find a way to maintain their relevancy from an energy perspective. And so do you believe, are these buildings, um, maybe not every single one of them, but this building stock, are they good buildings? Can they be net zero buildings? Uh, you know, how, what is this possible to make this existing stock much better than it currently is? Is it possible to make it better? Absolutely. There are things that you can do on every single building to improve its energy performance. Um, there are, is, 
zero capital cost things you can do to improve the energy performance of any building from an operation standpoint. You know, having the people that operate the building uh, well educated about where the energy is consumed and how they can conserve energy through the operations of the building is something that every single building owner should be doing. If you even if you're a building owner of a house, right, if you're a homeowner, you need to educate yourself about how you can control your own energy consumption. And then it scales up from there to campuses where you have very sophisticated facilities management staff who are controlling the consumption of millions of dollars worth of energy every year. And you can just change behaviors and change the way you operate and control the building to save energy. And then you get into the capital investment. Um, every building with mechanical heating, cooling has an opportunity for efficiency improvements. Every building with water heating has opportunities for efficiency improvements. If you are consuming energy, then yes, there's always something you can do. Now, the the depth at which you can save energy really is, is constrained by your capital. I think every building could be net zero, depending on how you look at it, right? But um, you've got a fixed footprint that every building lies within um, in the boundaries of its, um, of, it, of its land. So you do have limitations on how much renewable energy you can put on site. You have limitations on uh, capital for driving down the energy use intensity of a building. But there are things that you can do on every single building. I, I don't think that every building can be net zero. But if we think in those terms and we get as far as we can um, under some altered financial analysis metrics, then yes, I, th I think there are uh, significant strides we can make in every single building out there. Um, so it's, it's a nuanced conversation, right? There's a lot of, there's, there's a lot of nuance to it. What I love in hearing you talk about it is you can, um, the passion comes through, right? And I think all of us that are working in the ESG space, no matter what we're doing, it's a mission driven business and, and our passion is kind of what fuels it, right? Like I think we're capitalists, sure, and we want, but we're also um, altruistic and we want to see the right things happen. And I think that really comes through as you talk about, you know, um, the space. So I, I have a couple questions about the business specifically. So, you know, your webpage, front page center, you are leading with this. Um, carbon neutral living. What is, uh, what's driving that? Is it driven by, is it um, purely dollars and cents? Because as we know, even um, the most altruistic folks have to demonstrate returns, right? Or the business has to function, or is there something else underlying? Like what was the, um, how did it come to be? And what are the drivers that continue to um, make it, make this carbon neutral living be front and center of your brand and what you guys are trying to do? So I give a lot of credit to our CEO. Uh, Peter Merrigan is the um, owner of Taurus Investment Holdings, the CEO, and he is absolutely one of those visionaries that make you want to change the world. Right. And he is he's been involved in the real estate industry his entire career, and he saw the waves um of ESG really coming on shore of the real estate industry. And you you can't fight off the waves. They're coming regardless. So you have to find a way to work within them. And he recognized that climate change is a huge issue in in the around the globe, right? It's a huge issue facing every sector and and buildings and real estate represent about 40% of the emissions in the US, right? 40% of the carbon emissions. So that means buildings have to be part of the solution. And as Peter is was was looking in the industry as he was evaluating where the changes are going to occur in the industry, he saw the opportunity to get out ahead of the energy consumption as an opportunity, right? As an opportunity to be a leader in the space. And so he had the concept of renew communities to focus on retrofitting existing buildings. And it is an opportunity to look at a building as a resource. And typically when you're evaluating the energy consumption of a building, you look strictly at simple return on cost, right? If I invest in a you know, million dollars of capital, in this improvement and it saves me 
X number of dollars of energy consumption, then my, my simple return is whatever it is. But, you know, as we started developing Renew Communities and, and through multiple discussions, we really had the epiphany that you have to change the way you're looking at the evaluation of an energy efficiency mm -hmm. improvement. It's not just return on cost from an energy standpoint, but it's return on cost from building value, right? You, you have a lot of expenses associated with operating a building that are not just utility expenses. You have your capital reserve savings that's stranded capital sitting there waiting to deploy upon equipment failure. You have O&M. Uh, to operate your building. And as systems age, your O&M expenses go up. You have your utility cost. And then you have this concept of a, a green premium or a brown discount in the market, right? Um, for, for so long in the utility industry, we saw the super premium class A buildings getting a green premium. You know, they are the premier uh, building in the market. But now I think we're, we're starting to see the industry evolve to a brown discount where if you are not compliant with, you know, the CREM pathway or um, Energy Star metrics, then you are going to get a discounted value in your building because someone's going to have to come in and bring that that building back up to par. And so once you reevaluate the underwriting of your real estate from all of those perspectives combined, it really changes the thought of energy. It changes energy into a resource of the building that can make it more valuable. Um, so that's a that's a long answer to your question, but I think it's important to understand that it's it's an evolution of the entire real estate industry. Yeah, agreed. And it's been a while since I've heard the term um, green premium or brown discount, and that's that's exactly right. And I think um, those are the key facets to remember, especially now that ESG has become so divisive, right? And it's a hot topic, and everyone wants to talk about it, and either love it or bash it, or it's you know the newest um, kind of the argument to have. But I think with the folks where, where I go with the naysayers, right, the people that want to come and bash ESG, put it down and kind of align with the school of thought that um, it's woke capitalism or whatever it is, is that you can't deny like just the simple dollars and cents of like, do you want our customers to save money? Do you want is operating more efficiently and spending less money a good thing? Or do you want to spend more money on energy and what? Like, so if you just go peel back the very basics of the E, I mean, maybe more, more so the E than the S or the G, it's really hard to make an argument against just the practicality and the logic of that. So, um, yeah, I appreciate that perspective. Well, so, now that Florida is protecting the elderly from ESG, I feel thank God they so are. they're protected. Thank God. So that'll be fine. But when it, um, you mentioned, Chris, uh, I think an altered financial perspective or whatever earlier, and then you just explained what that was and said it's like a, a revolution or an evolution uh, in the way that we look at things. Is that happening? Uh, is this the innovators like your team and the people that you work with that are seeing that? Or is that methodology or that way of, of looking at the, the returns? Is that happening? Do you see it happening? So as I've gone throughout my career as an engineer, I've realized two facts or what I believe are facts. Uh, people that lawyers and people that control money control the world. Right. So at the end of the day, I can be very good from a technical perspective, but at the end of the day, it all comes down to dollars and cents. Right. And lawyers are there to protect the money. So really the money drives everything. And as we have um, gone out to look to do our fundraising for uh, purchasing real estate, right, as Taurus Investment Holdings and Renew work together to go evaluate buildings and look for new investment opportunities, we speak to a lot of capital managers. We speak to a lot of uh, pension funds and institutional money, right? And the money is requiring a focus on ESG. I cannot tell you how many firms we've spoken to that only talk to us because we have an ESG strategy. Or they say, if you didn't have an ESG strategy, we wouldn't be talking to you. You wouldn't even get a meeting with us. So the the money is and the equity in the market is really driving this, which leads me to see that it, it really is a, a fundamental shift in real estate and the evaluation of real estate. I think there will always be a place for the investors who don't care about 
the energy footprint and carbon footprint of a building, right? There'll always be those one-off um, opportunities, but to be able to deploy institutional level capital, it's an absolute requirement. Good. Okay. So we are, we are evolving. Yeah, I mean, more, like I said, more than evolving, I think, I think it has become very obvious that this is not just a, a, a unique strategy. This is not just a differentiator. This is really a requirement of all firms. And I think Taurus has been a leader in this industry, but over the next 10 years, I think every major real estate firm will have someone like me, someone from the technical perspective who can evaluate the, the climate risk of a building or the energy risk of a building. And how do you guys feel? So it sounds like you're the one at your firm that wears that hat. And we've seen that evolution also over the last decade specifically. I've been in the space more, you know, for more or less 20 years and have really seen roles like this formalized, right? Where before it was like someone would wear the hat part time that they had a full time job, but maybe they would be the ESG person. But now it's it's formal and there are people there are um, VP level roles, if not director roles and sometimes even C level roles around um, ESG and sustainability. So with that hat on or, you know, as you said, that's kind of what you're focused on for your business. How do you feel about the regulation? Is it intimidating? So you have, um, you know, Boston and California and now this these BPS requirements coming out. We're, we're building a whole product around BPS to help advocate for our customers and make sure that, you know, they understand the legislation. They understand how it can affect them because some of these fines associated with the upcoming legislation are pretty hefty. It's not just like, oh, you know, a couple hundred bucks. Sorry, I missed it. I'll pay you in arrears. Um, they, they could be upwards of six figures. Um, so how are you guys staying on top of that? I, it's a two part question, I suppose. How do you feel about the, the legislation? Do you think it's a good thing? Do you think the industry needs it? Do you think it's moving us all in the right direction? Or is it cumbersome and overkill and it's companies, you know, like Renew that are just going to lead the charge anyways, whether they're forced to or not? And then, um, depending on your opinion about it, how are you, how are you guys tackling it, making sure you stay ahead of it? So let's start with how I feel about it. Um, I, I think it's a necessary evil, right? Because I think you, you have to have carrots and sticks to move industries this large, right? I mean, we're, we're not trying to do something easy. We're trying to do something that is monumentally difficult. And that is, change the carbon footprint of billions of square feet of real estate and you have to find a way to force action um, we look at it from a, a financial perspective we think we get a, a more valuable building because of our activities which means that we have accretive strategies for each of our different asset types to improve the energy performance but not everyone's looking at it that way not everyone's willing to deploy the capital so Birdo, Local Law 97, you know, the regulations are there to drive action. Um, and it ultimately comes down to a financial trade off, right? Do you invest in your building, maintain its value, or do you pay the penalty? And you can continue to pay the, the increasing penalties and somebody else is going to take that money and invest in their buildings and, and ultimately reach the end game of reducing overall emissions. Um, so I, I think they're necessary. The extent to which they are enforced, I think, will be important to, mm -hmm. to really drive home that action. Um, now, the way that we address it is by keeping track of every market that we're in. You know, we are active in, gosh, a couple dozen key markets across the U.S., and when we have buildings in a particular area, we track what's going on in that local jurisdiction. But when we're evaluating a new building, um, Renew, as we're working with Taurus um, Investment Holdings acquisition teams, we'll go to a new market and we'll do a deep dive on what's happening in that market, what the regulatory risk is, what's evolving, what's being discussed so that we're aware of it. Um, and we track it and we create plans to address that in the buildings and in the markets that we're active within. Um, so, you know, if you're going to be in, involved in these markets, you have to find a way to address the local regulations. It's just, it's part of it. Um, it's no different than any other code or regulation. 
It'd be interesting to know if anyone, you know, who's super anti is specifically trying to avoid these markets and if that's even a viable strategy anymore. Um, I remember the map, you know, what it looked like that has just the dots and the colored states. It's kind of color coded for what the ordinance is and what size, you know, properties are affected. Um, and it almost seems like it'd be very hard. <laughs> You'd have to be avoiding some pretty major strategic markets if you were trying to dodge it altogether. Yeah, I mean, the municipalities that require some level of reporting is, is huge. Um, and I don't think you could run a business by just trying to run away from it because it, it ultimately will converge on you and you'll have no markets left, right? I mean, it starts with the largest markets, um, you yep. know, the very progressive markets, but then eventually it's gonna be everywhere. Yep, totally agree. Yeah, I agree. You might as well not be in real estate if you're just trying to dance around it. And, and some maybe will for a while, but that's the natural like change curve, right? Progressive or innovative things happen. And then some the next group says, okay, is that working out? Okay, okay, I'm going to participate. And then it just happens. So we're on that curve. So that's great. One um, related but a little different topic, uh, something that's very interesting to me, uh, EV vehicles. And I read a very interesting thing. No, it was in a story someone read to me. I, you can get these things like people will read you the news articles, kind of like an audible book thing. But anyway, it was a long form article and it uh, was that hybrids, hybrid cars are really setting us back, really setting us back because so many people say, yes, I'm going to get an EV, a fully electric vehicle, but not yet. I'm going to get this hybrid that came out, you know, halfway there sort of thing, which is setting the transition to full EV back decades because you know how long you own a car. So I'm like, man, that's crazy. That's disappointing. And then the other thing, when we talk about buildings and residents and communities, I took for granted the fact that I can plug an EV in at my home. And but how many renters are there out there or people that that own condos in multifamily situations? And what do you got? Maybe right now, if you're lucky, one or two or three spots in your garage or maybe you even park on the street. How can we press EV cars? Do we have solutions for for that? Obviously, you go to your closest one all the time. But if I couldn't charge at home, that that w would be a bigger barrier for me. What do you, what do you know about this? Yeah, so I, I think hybrids are kind of like streaming on a cathode ray tube TV, right? I mean, it's it's mixing of technologies that just aren't necessarily um, supportive of each other. And I agree, and I and I think I know the article that you're talking about. I think I read it as well. Um, but when you give somebody that option to stay in their comfort zone, it's very difficult to make the change. And it's almost, a, mm -hmm. I think, in, in terms of a, a psychological issue at that point and, and an enablement, enablement issue. Um, and until you just force that wholesale change, people will stick with the older technology as long as they possibly can. You know, I, I think along that same lines, you have the approach of keeping one uh, fossil fuel vehicle, right? Diesel or gasoline car, and then one hybrid car in your family. If you're a two car family where you're, you're making that transition. And, and I think that's a little bit better, but enabling hybrid vehicles um, simply delays the transition because people keep vehicles for so long, you know, now to convert yeah. that person to all electric, you're talking another five, seven, 10 years. Um, but EV charging, I think, will undergo a complete change over the next 10 years. I think it will become absolutely the default commonplace for people to have electric vehicles, even um, for long haul uh, trips. You know, I, I do a lot of trips that are 90 to 100 miles, and you can do that with existing technology all day long. Right. It's the people who want to go across the country who really say, no, nah, I can't. EV won't work for me. But but the charging infrastructure is there. The charging infrastructure for for most uh, vehicles is there already in all buildings. And I say that um, I, I say that because of the understanding of what it really takes to charge a vehicle. Right. Most people drive from home to work and it's 
11 miles. I think that's the, the average commute is 11 miles. Mm. You can recharge your vehicle from that 11 mile commute by plugging it in at home in a 110 outlet, you know, just a standard mm-hmm. wall. You don't need a big expensive. That's EV all charger. I do. Yeah. yeah. And, and, yeah. and for most trips that absolutely works and you could drive all week long and consume, you know, 55 miles worth of battery, yeah. plug it in yeah. over the weekend. You're ready to go again Saturday afternoon off of a 110 outlet. So the infrastructure is already there in buildings. Um, every single person that drives to work, if you drive to a big office building and you've got 2000 cars there, not every one of those cars needs to charge, right? Everyone just drove 11 miles. They didn't drive 300 miles to get from home to work. Um, and so you can utilize the existing infrastructure to charge all the vehicles that you need. It just means that you, you now take the electric grid. And you have sort of this base load on the whole electric grid that's, you know, a couple of, or a small portion of vehicles charging at any one time, right? So it resets your, your base load for utilities. Um, but when you think about it in terms of like multifamily, you know, you mentioned going home to your house and plugging it in. You can kind of do whatever you want to the electrical infrastructure in your home. You can install a 240 volt um charger for your EV. Not everyone in an apartment can do that, right? So say you're you're going to a garden style apartment community where everyone shares common space, um, no one has dedicated parking spots, then you have different things to consider, right? So we're developing our EV strategy for multifamily right now, and it, and it changes based on the markets and based on um, the layout of the property. So the things that we start to think about is what is the existing electrical infrastructure, right? Is, does every single building have its own uh, house panel, right? House electric panel and house service where we could pull uh, property owned chargers to every single building, or is there only one service at the clubhouse? Um, do residents have access to an exterior 110 volt outlet or do we have to now pull new infrastructure for that? So we're thinking through the the infrastructure piece and then there's the other component of how do you interact with the tenants on this from a billing standpoint and from a, an access to the spots, to the charging spot standpoint. Um, a lot of residents want to know that they're going to have a charger when they show up. And so they're thinking they're going to get a dedicated EV charger spot. And I, and I don't necessarily think that that's the way it's going to work. If you have shared community chargers in an apartment community, you have to have some way of letting the person charge. So you got to figure out access controls, whether yeah. it's a key card or whether it's a pay per use or whether it's a pin code, you have to think about how you're going to charge them but then you have to have idle time restrictions, meaning there, yeah. there needs to be a charge for that person just sitting there taking up the, the charger spot. Um, and, and so we're thinking through what software layer do you put on top of all of this hardware to make sure you can manage that interaction with tenants, make it fair, make it equitable, um, but then also keep people from hogging spots. Now, th- there are circumstances that we're looking at dedicated EV premium spots and those would be uh, spots that carry a premium over and above an assigned parking spot because there's a lot of infrastructure costs there and it's basically going unused a majority of the day. Yeah. Okay. So let me share maybe the unpopular opinion or, um, and I'm, oh, and I'm all for ooh. EVs and I believe in um, the future of it, but you know, you guys mentioned that hybrid might be slowing it down. I don't know if I agree with that. So I, I talk with a lot of people like it's scary, right? It's a leap of faith. And and there are other scary things associated with it. Like you're talking about, I might get home to my apartment. There might not be a spot. What if I can't charge my car? Like there's a lot of fear associated with it. I feel like the hybrid is a good way for people to like start using it being like, wow, when I'm on electric, I'm saving so much money on gas. This is really great. I'm not using gas as much. I'm starting to get comfortable. I'm learning the infrastructure. So it's just for people who are not ready to rip off the Band-Aid. And then maybe their next vehicle will be the EV, right? Versus if you just go straight to EV, it, it will, for some people, like I think of my parents or you know just other people, old school people, um, they, they won't probably buy one until like the gasoline car is not available anymore or something. 
but they would maybe step into an, uh, a hybrid car and then, wow, I'm spending half as much on gas or something and then um, go all the way. So again, maybe an unpopular opinion, but I think it will help some folks transition that just aren't ready to be that cutting edge um, and do it. And then, yeah, I mean, it, it requires a whole other layer, layer level of management at the apartment communities, um, certainly where, you know, even just the maintenance, if something breaks, if someone can't get to work because they couldn't charge their car, but someone was supposed to make sure they were policing it. Um, it reminds me a little bit, this is not the same because it's not as dire of like someone missing work, but back in the day when we were doing the lead certification projects, you were, you could get points for reserving a certain number of spots for um, electric vehicles or hybrid vehicles, right? So everybody would put up the sign and they'd say this parking spot is reserved for, you know, the electric vehicle, the hybrid vehicle. And that's it. They'd get their points, right? But no one was enforcing it, right? You could park in a, um, an Escalade in there and no one cared. Um, so it just, it comes, there's more that comes along with, you know, than just putting in the infrastructure. Put Take on. So again, unpopular opinion, but I do that sometimes. So. And, and well, I completely understand that opinion, right? I mean, I understand that it's a gateway car. Um, and as long as people are embracing the plug-in portion of, of a hybrid, and that's, that's what we're talking about here is the, the plug-in hybrid um, electric vehicle. And as long as people are embracing yeah. the plug-in component and keeping that battery charged and forming the habits of thinking about charging their vehicle, then I, then I agree with you. I think it, it is a positive for the overall industry. Yeah. yeah, and I and I agree with your point. The article agrees with your point. The stu the scientific study <clears throat> agreed with your point that it does make it accessible to someone else, and that's the problem because they're doing that instead, and it's setting it back. Whereas if they weren't available, maybe some people wouldn't move, but the a lot of the hybrid people would go ahead and move, and we'd actually get emissions reduced more quickly. Was the result of the study, but I agree with you. No question, people will select the hybrid because they're more comfortable with it. Um, and, and so, as we're thinking through our strategy on our properties right now, we're targeting about five percent of the parking capacity of a property, right? So, if mm -hmm. if you have five hundred uh, parking spaces, we're trying to get about twenty five of those to be EV charging spots, and that gives you a lot of runway to figure this out, right? To figure out how to keep people from uh, hogging a parking space, you know, it, inevitably it's going to happen. So how do you work with the tenants to find the processes that work most effectively? You know, we're also exploring third party ownership options where you just let somebody else come in and, and they install the infrastructure and, and they worry about the, um, the return metrics of it. And, and then they're just going to install as much as they can get a return on. Um, so there's a lot of different ways to address it right now. As long as people are thinking about it, I think that's where we need to be. Property owners need to be thinking about it, how they're going to address the uh, the infrastructure component. And that goes for multifamily, office, and then one that we're looking at heavily is industrial. Right? Mm -hmm. We have uh, ESG strategies for industrial. And if you think about last mile logistics, that will probably be the first industry to completely electrify because the vans and the delivery trucks can be electric right now. Yeah. Uh, and so uh, industrial buildings have to be ready for this coming wave as well. Yeah, I if we can get that last mile of fleet to EV, then grandma and grandpa can keep their you know combustion engine for a little bit longer if we can tackle that fleet thing, that's, that's fine. Yeah. yeah, and I'll say that Healy uh, or Chris, I'll commit to both of you. If I ever see a combustion engine Range Rover specifically parked mm -hmm. in an EV spot, I will resort to some old school pranks. I don't know, salami on the door or eggs, or I'll, I'll, I'll do something about it as a, as a vigilante. Well, well, you know, I, I'm from Atlanta. I'm from the South. Um, and I said I would never transition to an electric vehicle until they had the, the F-150. Well, you know, Ford took care of that now. And so my next truck will yeah. be in F-150. Awesome. Yeah. Cool. Nice. Um, I had one other question I, that's always been on my mind that I think maybe you'll have a good point of view on. Um, solar energy for buildings. 
just quick thought. Is it going to be is the best way to be completely locally, meaning that we try and put it on every building and that building serves its own energy? Or do you have community local where like you have plants in your community and you just build like a night enough solar that's a reasonable size that can serve a community? Or do we get to even more decentralized where we have these big grids, you know, big sections of all the solar? Is is there a better strategy or is it a mix of strategies? Do you know anything about that? Yeah. I think you already know the answer. It's 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 a mix, right? I mean, every one of those has its place. Um, when I'm evaluating a building, my first strategy is to reduce the energy consumption of the building, right? Efficiency sure. should be the, the first renewable resource, right? Um, use less. And then do as much on-site solar as possible. That way you don't have the, the distribution losses. You're not trying to transmit it. It's consumed right there. Um, and then you can start to look at community programs and local um, regional utility offered renewable energy because it's all uh, it's all there for the same goal. And that's reducing overall carbon emissions. But it really needs to start with what you control on your property. Um, we, we have a lot of unused land in areas that generate a lot of solar energy. Right. And so why not do central plants and distribute it into larger cities where you don't have the space to offset your load on site? Um, so there's a place for community and regional level programs, even, even large transmission scale renewable energy um, will have a place. And some of the recent uh, IRA components include distribution or transmission system upgrades really for that thought of the future where we have these huge renewable energy plants and you have to push energy across very long distances. Um, and, and so there are strategies for each of those and applications to buildings. And, you know, one of the cool technologies that I'll throw in that we look at is a solar distribution technology for multifamily that allows you to build one array on a roof and then share that energy across multiple apartments apartments evenly. So you can build one 20 kW array and evenly divide it across four apartments where you're not having to build all of the infrastructure to each individual apartment. Um, and nice. so the the industry is evolving as well. You know, solar, the solar industry is very mature at this point, but there are um, new technologies coming in that make it just more and more applicable to other situations. Yeah, I guess I'll have to admit I've been the the grandma and grandpa on the solar i was waiting until it got to mm -hmm. a certain i was like ah it seems too early which i don't do most things i don't do that i buy things obnoxiously too early but that one i've been waiting and and i was just about convinced now is the time and you said it's mature but then you also said there's some new stuff coming so i might i might wait a little bit longer there, there, there will always be new stuff coming right that's the that's the fun sure. part about about my job and my careers, I've always seen new technologies, but that doesn't mean you need to wait. Um, you know, it, it's fully solar in all segments is fully mature right now, right? If you want it on your home, it, it's you're ready. It's time. Um, we continue to see advances in in solar density or how much power you can get out of a a, a fixed area right. panel. Um, we continue to see evolution in battery storage. You know, we'll always see technology evolution, but now now's the time. Be part of the cool. solution. All right. Well, I'll do it then. No, I I, I accept that that challenge. Um, I will I will do it. It's it's the time. Um, I do believe someday we're gonna laugh that that some people have batteries like six by six batteries hanging in their garage that are you know that, that are gonna end up being this big you know real small pretty soon. But Healy, any last questions before uh, the big fan favorite game that I have? I don't think so. No further ado. Get to the game. It's what the listeners want. Game. Give the people okay. what they want. Got to give them what they want sometimes, everybody. So uh, this game, Chris, is called Beans or Beer. All you have to do is tell me if you think this maker, this product that I tell you, is a coffee product or a beer product. That's all. Beans or beer. It's a 50-50 guess at the end of the day. Uh, so mm. you can figure it out. Um, this comes from, I'll uh, kind of give the preview first. It comes from a popular mechanics geek list we all acknowledged uh our proud uh proud to be nerd situations in our discussion so this comes from a geek list uh, i thought it was mildly interesting but it is called snake river 
Shira. That is a coffee. Beans. No. No, Damn. it is not. Oh, it is a beer. I was, um, I was yeah, of it. you did. You sounded confident, which is which really is a good strategy, but but that doesn't that doesn't fix it. Do you <laughs> know what you're uh, you're not buying it? No. <laughs> I bought it. You know I bought it based on just the confidence in the response. But let's see how geeky we are. Do you know what Shira is? I like do not Shira? educate me. Like he man huh? and Shira. The comic He man and Shira. Do you remember yeah. he Okay. Yeah. Got it. Got right. it. <laughs> yeah, we're trying to bring some, you know, we try to highlight some of the uh, people that have been underrepresented. And I think He-Man seems to be more popular, but She-Ra was awesome as well. Um, everyone in their, their 40s that's listening to this will know exactly what, what we are referring to. But anyway, Snake River Brewing makes what, what looks like an interesting beer. It's a Goza beer. I, I Gozas aren't necessarily my favorite beers. But uh, I am going to try a couple of them on this geekiest uh, list. Other ones are like Star Wars beers and uh, Game of Thrones Don't beers. Don't ever like Star Wars beers. You will definitely drink a Star Wars beer before. I will definitely drink a Star Wars times. beer. You know, since, since you stumped me, Ryan, I'm going to go find that beer because I do like yours. Uh, I'm going to find it and oh, I'm going to try perfect. it. And I'll report, I'll report back to you. Snake. <laughs> I appreciate it. Yeah, Snake River, uh, Snake River Shira. Well, thank you for playing. All right. This has been another wonderful episode of the ESG Experience podcast. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed your time with us, make sure to subscribe on your favorite podcast directory. There's a new episode every month. We appreciate our loyal subscribers and listeners for continuing to support this podcast. And if you want to keep up the conversation between episodes, follow us on your favorite social media channel at hashtag ESG Experience. Thanks again, Chris. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Thank you listeners. Much.